Thank you, Rob. Um, so if all goes well, my presentation, yep, there we are. Okay, I want to talk about um, uh, two ideas that connect to carbon taxes. One, the double dividend, which has already been mentioned, and the other, tax interaction. Um, the idea of using taxes to correct externalities or external costs has been around in the economics literature at least since the 1920s. And the basic idea in uh, a simple theoretical context is if you put a, a charge on the emissions equal to what we call the marginal damages or what was just referred to as the social cost of carbon in the case of CO2 emissions, uh, if you put that tax in place, then all the, the market activity that follows in response to the tax will yield the optimal outcome in the sense of the allocation of the abatement activity throughout the economy. The market will be induced to find out the least cost way of reducing emissions and the appropriate level to which to reduce emissions and how to distribute that burden of abatement throughout the economy in the most efficient way possible. And uh, one of the points about the, uh, uh, the Pigouvian uh, literature here, or the uh, emission tax literature, is that um, we don't really care at this point what happens to the revenue simply by dealing with an uncontrolled externality in an economic model, you can create a welfare gain. You can make the economy better off. Whereas in all other cases when we analyze taxes, when you put a tax in place, you make people worse off. And in fact, uh, the standard economic analysis of taxes contains what's called the, the Harburger Triangle or the deadweight loss triangle, which means you have to destroy more than a dollar's worth of economic welfare to raise a dollar for the government. So taxes always create deadweight losses with the exception of emission taxes, which in principle can be welfare enhancing as long as you're moving emissions from above their optimal level down to their optimal level. Of course, you can overshoot that and get into a welfare reduction space, but I'll assume that we're not there yet. So in the 1990s, as, as the CO2 issue came to the fore, something different came up, which was in most cases when we think about emission taxes, these would be very tiny markets. You have fairly small amounts of money, fairly small tax rates. They don't really show up in a macroeconomic sense, but CO2 would be different because for the United States, for instance, if you're starting with one and a half gigatons of carbon emissions and you put a $30 per ton tax in place and that gets you to 1.2 gigatons, I'm just making those numbers up, that's $36 billion. So then you start getting into potential macroeconomic effects and so economists had to think a bit more seriously about how carbon taxes would interact with the rest of the tax system. And so there are two issues to think about. So first of all, what do you do with all this revenue? The instinctive answer in economics was you use the carbon tax revenue to pay for reductions in other taxes. In other words, when we do the analysis, we assume that uh, there's a constraint put in place that the government doesn't collect any more taxes than it did before the carbon tax. So you're going to use that revenue to reduce your most distortionary taxes at the margin. In doing so, uh, since every tax has its own excess burden amount attached to it, if the carbon tax generates a smaller excess burden than, um, say, a, a payroll tax that gets reduced, you could potentially move to a slightly more efficient tax system. And this is where the term the double dividend got coined, that you put in the tax ostensibly to deal with some kind of pollution externality and in the process, you made your tax system slightly more efficient. And so uh, in the 1990s, people began throwing around this idea of the double dividend. However, there's a second component to it, which I'll get to, which is the tax interaction effect. Uh, the new tax that comes in place on consum consumer goods, namely uh, fuel consumption, raises consumer costs, reduces real wages, and those have direct effects. But they also affect those excess burdens that are associated with the taxes in all those markets. Okay, so the double dividend hypothesis uh, came out in a couple of different forms back in the 1990s. There was uh, an overly strong or overly optimistic version of it, which was that once you take it into account, emission taxes are always welfare enhancing, no matter what the circumstances. So um, this uh, got a, a, a bit of play at the time, but there's obviously lots of flaws with that reasoning. Uh, the emission taxes um, aren't always welfare enhancing, especially if you overshoot the optimum and, and you're into a region of overkill on your environmental policy. The weaker version of it was that once revenue recycling is taken into account, 
we should revisit this old classical rule of setting the tax equal to marginal damages, and now we should have a new rule that says we'll set the tax higher than marginal damages, or in this case, higher than the social cost of carbon, because we need to take into account this double dividend argument. However, uh, model simulations, computable general equilibrium model simulations that were done on this topic didn't back that idea up. And uh, where that idea seemed to come from was in a, in a very simple economic model where if, um, it, it makes sense if you do it, although it won't make sense when I say it now, but if you construct a model economy where there's no tax system and then you introduce a carbon tax, that's what the classical model has in mind, so there's no existing distortions in the tax system. In that case, uh, yes, you get a double dividend, but you don't have any tax interaction effects. So when the analysts who do this kind of work began to introduce enough detail into the tax system so they could get the revenue recycling effect, they also noticed that once you get more detail in the tax system, these tax interaction effects kick in. Now this graph here, I won't go over it in any uh, real detail, but the dotted lines, these are showing uh, on the horizontal axis the percentage carbon emission reduction target and on the vertical axis, the marginal economic cost of the carbon emission reductions. The dotted lines are from a model that has no pre-existing fuel taxes in it. The solid lines are the model that has a pre-existing fuel tax system in it. And then the lower line in each pair is the carbon tax. The higher line is the cap and trade system. So the whole set of cost curves shifts up once you take into account the pre-existing fuel taxes. So carbon tax interacts with that market exacerbates the excess burden associated with those pre-existing fuel taxes to such an extent that in this analysis, which was in the American Economic Review in 1996, the authors found that in an economy with pre-existing fuel taxes, your very first ton of CO2 emission reductions, even if it's done with a revenue neutral carbon tax, costs $25 per ton, and then the costs go up from there. The very first ton of uh, carbon emission reductions from cap and trade cost $55 a ton. And so the authors pointed out, given the typical estimates of marginal damages, that means it just uh, would never pass a cost-benefit test. Okay, so yeah, with estimated marginal damages of about $5 a ton, um, this means the optimal policy would be to have no carbon tax at all. Or in other words, the optimal tax here is less than marginal damages. So that ties back into that earlier point that I made once you take into the account the double dividend, doesn't that mean you want to tax higher than marginal damages? But these kinds of analyses were coming out and saying, well, actually, no, you should have a, an optimal tax below the level of marginal damages. And so this led to some thinking about why does the pre-existing tax system matter? And so there was a fair amount of theoretical work done on this in the 1990s. The new carbon tax, as I mentioned, it raises consumer prices, reduces real wages, and you add a revenue neutrality condition into the model. So that means you have to adjust other tax rates to deal with this. And it's those adjustments to the other tax rates and also the shrinking of some of the other tax bases that exacerbates the distortions associated with the other taxes. So then the question is, okay, which effect is larger? You get a benefit from revenue recycling, your double dividend benefit. In other words, using the new carbon tax revenue to reduce some other tax rates. But you also have a cost associated with all these tax interactions, which effect is, is larger. Now in a simple model that was published in 95 by Ian Perry, uh, his argument just looking at the interaction between um, an energy type market with carbon emissions and a labor market, it's likely under typical empirical uh, conditions on elasticities that the tax interaction effect would be larger. The, in that kind of a model, um, the optimal tax would be defined according to this formula, which I won't go into detail, but it's in chapter eight of my textbook, um, which is actually titled The Economic Analysis of Environmental Policy, just to, correcting a, a point of Rob's there. Um, the, uh, the, the way to think about this is the tax, the optimal tax should be marginal damages plus a term that reflects the change in the deadweight losses in the other markets. And that second term only goes to zero if you already have a tax, if you don't have a tax system or if you have uh, uh, a labor market where the labor supply is fixed. And since that's not generally going to be the case, the second term 
matters. And typically, the second term is going to be negative, so the optimal tax should be less than marginal damages. So in typical economies, and the, the particular empirical case here is that um, if you think of the labor tax rate being on average maybe 33%, I know it's probably higher than that, but that gives us the inverse of 33% would be 3. You'd need a labor supply elasticity uh, greater than 3 for that term to go positive, and that's uh, just not going to happen. So um, the typical result then is that the optimal tax should be less than marginal damages. So here's how that, what that implies in terms of the optimal policy. Uh, the, the way we set this up in, in an economic analysis is uh, we have emissions on the horizontal axis, pollution emissions, and the price of emissions on the vertical axis. We have the social cost of emissions or the marginal damages reflected in some kind of line that might have an upward slope like that. And then we have the marginal cost of reducing emissions is uh, a downward sloping line, or in other words, it's upward sloping if you start at high emissions and you move down to zero emissions, your marginal cost of reducing emissions has to keep getting higher and higher. And where those lines cross is the classical solution of your optimal emissions level and the optimal price that you should charge on emissions. But now if the optimal price, oops, I wonder if I can, okay, I'll leave it at that for now. I'll come back to that diagram. But you can, anticipating slightly, if the optimal price is down here, that means the optimal level of emissions is going to end up being higher. But I'll, I'll show that after a couple more slides. Late in the 1990s, um, somebody noticed in a comment in the American Economic Review that we're actually reinventing the wheel here. This was actually all thought through back in the 1970s by a Swedish economist, Agnar Sanmo, in a rather little known article in the Swedish Journal of Economics where he asked the question, suppose we have a general equilibrium model of an economy and we solve for the optimal tax system, but we impose the rule that, first of all, the government needs to raise a lot of money and secondly, it can't, use, can't rely on lump sum taxes. It has to use ad valorem taxes on prices. What would the optimal tax system look like? Well, that, lots of people had already thought about it at that point, but he added, what if one of those goods in the economy generates a pollution externality? And so he worked it all out. It's a, a very intensely mathematical uh, model. But what he worked out was the optimal tax on the externality good should be marginal damages times this adjustment factor R. And R is an index of how distortionary the rest of the tax system is. Now, in the classical case, you have no tax system, so it just equals 1. But in the general case, where you do have an existing tax system, R has to be less than 1. And in particular, R is, formally speaking, the inverse of the marginal cost of public funds, which I'll explain that. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned before the classical or the standard result in the analysis of taxes is that you have to destroy more than a dollar's worth of economic welfare to raise a dollar for the government. So the typical marginal cost of public funds uh, for the U.S. economy would work out to be somewhere around 1.4, meaning uh, you lose $1.40 worth of consumer and producer welfare to generate a dollar more for the public sector. So the inverse of that would be about 0.7. So that means this optimal externality tax should be about 0.7 times the value of marginal damages, or about 70% of marginal damages. Now, um, in Sanmo's article, he, he, he does explain this seems a bit counterintuitive. Two minutes. The more distortionary your tax system is, the lower the price on externalities should be. But it actually does make sense in, in the public finance context because the more distortionary your tax system is, the costlier it is to provide public goods and externality control is a form of public goods. Okay, so if we apply this to the carbon tax, Let's take the administration's uh, shiny new estimate of the social cost of carbon at $38 a ton for all the reasons that Rob mentioned and many more besides. We'll assume that that's probably at least twice what it should be. So we'll say $19 a ton. Now we reduce that by 30% to take into account the uh, net tax distortion effect. So we're down to about $13 a ton. What does that mean? Well, in this case, the demand is inelastic. Uh, 
for CO2 emissions because they're derived from fossil fuel consumption. And fossil fuel markets are very inelastic. They're very price insensitive. So if you put a carbon tax in place at that rate, your emissions really wouldn't change. So at the conclusion of that, it would make sense to ask, why even bother? If for all the cost and the disruption of imposing a carbon tax, you're going to end up with more or less the same emissions that you had initially. Uh, we could easily ask, why bother? And this also goes back to some of those CGE calculations before. Once you take into account all the, uh, the hidden costs of policies, uh, that first unit of emissions reduction probably cost you more than even an optimistic benefit of estimate of the benefits of reducing the emissions. So looking at this from an optimal pricing point of view, you end up so close uh, between the resulting emissions level and the unregulated emissions level that uh, it wasn't worth bothering in the first place. So to summarize, interactions of carbon taxes with the rest of the tax system need to be taken into account because these are large taxes, large amounts of money. They have macroeconomic consequences. Theory and empirical work indicates that the negative tax interactions dominate the gains from revenue recycling. The optimal tax rate is less than marginal damages and, in fact, is so low in this case that the change in emissions would likely be negligible. And so the standard proposals for a carbon tax uh, as a policy measure are likely not worth the cost. And um, one final point here, uh, one of the differences between the economic approach to carbon pricing and more of an activist approach, I guess you might say, is that when we talk about carbon pricing, we really have a target on the price axis, not the quantity axis. So the point of introducing, say, a $15 a ton carbon tax is that people would pay $15 per ton, not that you would hit some arbitrary target on the quantity axis. So uh, when people start talking about why it would be a good idea to use a carbon tax and then they pull some magic number like a 30% emission reductions out of their hat uh, and say carbon tax would be a good way of hitting that quantity target, um, right away they've, they've uh, gone off uh, sensible economic analysis unless they can show that that 30% reduction is somehow the point where marginal damages and, and uh, the marginal costs of emission reductions are equated, and that's really not likely to be the case given how inelastic fuel markets are in an economy like the U.S. So I'll stop there.